So without further ado, I'm going to talk, or Elise and I are going to talk today about scleral lens terminology, and we're kind of, it's going to be a little different than our usual terminology talk because we're going to intermix what you're actually doing and how you're using the terminology a bit. And so we're also going to share with you some of the clinical resources that we have through the Scleral Lens Society that can be useful to you in practice and communicating with labs and patients. Again, my name is Maria Walker. I am the current president of the Scleral Lens Education Society. I teach um, and do research here in Houston, Texas at the University of Houston, uh, mostly contact lenses, mostly scleral lenses, um, but I, I'm very interested in both research and clinic related to scleral lenses. And Dr. Kramer, uh, it's, and she, you can tell our, uh, I think we had like a, a Freudian moment here. She's OS, I'm OD. Uh, no, she's an optometrist and she's in Miami. I think she's at the Miami, um, her clinic in Miami right now, she's at two different clinics. Uh, that she works at in Miami today. She's at the one that has my name, Miami Contact Lens Institute, I guess is, is what it's called. Um, both of us do a little bit of speaking for other companies. Um, probably the most relevant disclosure tonight is that I am the president of the Scleral Lens Society and Elise is the public education chair. Um, and without further ado, we'll talk a bit about, start talking about terminology, right? So uh, first, what is the Scleral Lens Education Society? So we're a nonprofit uh, started in 2009, really dedicated to public education for scleral lenses. And one mission that I'll kind of point out tonight, because that's really the purpose behind why we did this and why we have this talk every year. Um, one of our missions really is to help facilitate communication and understanding, right, about scleral contacts and lenses uh, between clinics, labs, and patients. So a lot of what we'll talk about is, uh, you know, the terminology that we use. And we, we really think it's important that we're all on the same page. And so part of our, our mission is to help get everybody kind of up to speed with what is the kind of official terminology used. And Elise and I will go back and forth a little bit because we, we talked a little bit before this. Like anything, there's there's things that are very academic and maybe aren't as relevant. So we're gonna to try to focus on uh, some of the really clinically relevant terminology that we use. Um, and, you know, Elise and I may may go back and forth and may agree or disagree. And that's that's part of, um, you know, why we've, we've come and, and trying to kind of universalize the, the uh, language that we use. So a brief just history, just to kind of remind us all of how this how this story evolved, right? So scleral lenses, conceptually, any type of contact lens was conceptualized in the early 16th century. So the first lenses uh, somewhere independently in about 1887 in a few different areas in Europe. Uh, and then again, most of us know by, by now, it's that the scleral lens, we always have this little anecdote of the scleral lens was the first lens. It seems like it's the most recent lens, but really it was the first one developed and it was in blown glass uh, around that time. And you can see these images of these scleral lenses. I always find it interesting because um, and, and you can see our first acronym here, SL. So that was one of the, the first things that our terminology, and we'll talk about how we actually sat down and figured out the terminology. But, um, you know, one of the first ones is what is what is the acronym for a scleral lens, right? We had SCCL, SCL, SL. Um, so we ended up going with SL. So if you see SL, try to use SL if you can. So we're all doing the same thing. Um, I think more and more people are doing that now. But Again, back to the, these lenses, um, you know, they look a lot different than a lot of our lenses today. A lot of our lenses today are, are symmetrical. These were more molded for, for the patient's eye. Here's another picture of a molded scleral lens, but with a fenestration uh, on it. And I always like to kind of go full circle showing that you know, we started with these really, um, you know, asymmetric lenses. And then this bottom lens here, this is actually I stole from Elise's uh, practice website. Uh, you can see on the bottom, that's what most of our scleral lenses look like. So we've gone from like this molded lens to this, you know, more symmetrical, more kind of smooth looking lens. But then you can see up here, we also have this newer technology. This is an iPrint Pro lens um, where we can mold the lens again. So really full circle, but um, scleral lenses are here and here to stay. So I think, you know, terminology wise, 
uh, we got to make sure we're speaking the same language. And so that's really what part of what thing organizations like the Scleral Lens Education Society are here for, to help be kind of a common um, ground where we can discuss this, we can determine what the actual standards are. And I'll mention it. Uh, later, but there's there is what you may have heard of the ISO. That's actually the International Standards Organization. So um, there's entire organizations about this, right? Because terminology is really important for learning, and then also for communicating with each other about what we're actually talking about. Um, if you've been in practice for a while, even if you haven't, you'd probably remember, certainly if you're a recent grad, you can remember when you were learning about face curves and things, and it was just so mind boggling to have to try to keep track of these different terms. So if you have seven different terms for one thing, it gets really confusing. Um, and so some of you, hopefully, if you're a younger practitioner, some of this has already been adopted, um, but it's been, it's been pretty recent. And I think with scleral lenses increase, saying this universal language is, is even more uh, effective, I think, and also efficient for communication between labs and industry partners and clinical sites and the whole entire healthcare system, which of course, as you see from my little diagram, are all what's going to lead to the best patient care and success. And I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Kramer in a moment. She'll talk a little bit more about these, but um, or maybe not these, just talk about fitting them. Um, but, you know, just to remind us all, too, of where we've come and where we are today, the, the indications for scleral lenses um, beyond irregular astigmatism into ocular surface disease, and now we're even seeing more and more patients with, with normal cornea. So we're really seeing this transition where more and more individuals are being fit with scleral lenses, again, making it more and more important that we actually uh, have the right names and nomenclature and have some organization with how we, how we discuss the lenses. So the question is, are we going to a new consensus? We know that we have all these established applications for scleral lenses, irregular corneas, diseased eyes, ocular surface disease. But a lot of the time, um, we can use scleral lenses in patients that have normal corneas. And the question is, why would we want to do that? Well, I think, you know, first of all, I'm an example of that. I wore scleral lenses for about four years. I had really bad GPC. It's just an example to show you um, that even, and, and I have normal corneas, but I do use and, and fit scleral lenses in patients that have irregular uh, corneas, but also normal corneas. So, you know, high refractive errors, presbyopia. So the scleral lens is extremely stable um, because it's fit so in, in a way that's so customized to our patient's eyes that it, it's so stable and centered when it's fit correctly that we can correct so many things in the same lens. So, you know, a refractive error like myopia, hyperopia, presbyopia, and astigmatism all at once. Um, patients who do sports and, or, or work in very dusty environments, for example, had a patient once I was doing in, in horse racing and those were really dusty areas and again allergy control GPC and other allergies so these would all be cases with normal corneas non-diseased eyes where you would want to use a scleral lens so it's always important to evaluate the risk versus benefits, evaluate options. So on the left side of this of these images, you see cases where a scleral lens would definitely be ideal, like a corneal transplant or someone with severe irregularity. And then on the right side, you know, sports, again, presbyopia, different conditions where you may consider a scleral lens. So we came out with this paper in 2019. It was Nangis Michaud from Montreal, Michael Lipson, myself, and, and Dr. Maria Walker. And what we did is we reviewed all of these terminologies and created a paper in hopes that it would be adopted by industry practitioners and patients. So it came from a committee of 12 advanced scleral lens clinicians that met at the GSLS in 2017. They reviewed the literature on scleral lenses and again referred to the International Standards Organization, the ISO, as Dr. Walker mentioned, for guidance. And they worked for over two years to develop a consensus and published again in 2000. 2019. This is published in Contact Lens and Interior Eye. 
So there's three main sections in this paper, definitions, general terminology, and terminology related to sterile lens parameters. So if you see here, these is, this is basically an overview of all the different uh, terminologies, acronyms, acronyms, and also values. So it's definitely exhaustive, and we may not be using all of these all the time, but it's good to have and it's good to use. And our hope is that really everyone adopts these and so that the acronyms become familiar. So for example, in optometry, we have different acronym, acronyms that we all use in charts and you know EHRs and so it would be ideal to be able to use these acronyms as well. So you can see some of these power, uh, primary functional lens diameter, optic zone, um, and wetting angle, oblateness, uh, localized bolting. So a lot of these are really useful and we'll go through some of them that we find extremely useful in day-to-day -day practice, scleral lens practice, and some of them that may not be used as often but are still good to have in the back of your mind. So the scleral lens, let's start with SL. So as Dr. Walker pointed out, we use, we've seen in papers SCCL, SCL, but we've adopted SL as the scleral lens. So SL is a scleral lens, a lens fitted to vault over the entire cornea, including the limbus, and to land on the conjunctiva overlying the sclera. And FR would be the fluid reservoir. So you can see here in this diagram on the right, SL, which is the lens, and then you see FR, which is the fluid reservoir in the cornea, of course. So when we talk about scleral lens technology, terminology, other really important uh, terminologies are overall diameter, which is the longest diameter of the lens. You can see here in the dark blue, um, which is at the base of the lens in the image there. Total sagittal depth, which is the lens measured from the base to the apex of the lens, and the optic zone radius, or OZR, which is radius of curvature in the optic zone. Um, and then you have a front FOZR and a back BOZR, which also exists. So this is usually written with the optic zone diameter, um, for example, 7.8 millimeters, BC, 8 millimeters. Yeah, so I am going to kind of take over and dive a little bit deeper into this SAG term because this is something we talked about a, ad nauseum back and forth. And, you know, I think it can get, this is where maybe it gets a bit academic, but I think it's good to learn and kind of go through. And then I, I think the most important thing is that you know what you're talking about when you say SAG or when you say the height of the ocular or when you're comparing the the actual sag of the lens to the sag of the eye right because those aren't going to be equal so in the paper we really defined um you know the, the, so what you're looking at here is the definitions of the actual cornea and sclera itself so we sort of said okay the sagittal height of the actual ocular surface, which you can see we acronymed OSHO, that's at whatever cord you want to choose. Say you want to say 15, 16 millimeters on the sclera. You drop a cord, you measure the height to the apex of the cornea. Not to be confused with the sagittal height of the cornea, which is going to be related to that, right? Because the sagittal height of the cornea is going to be part of that measurement, <coughs> excuse me, of the sagittal height of the ocular surface. I think where this comes into play is for people who use the OCT or really want to know what the actual depth of the patient's eye is. Now, for us, you kind of know if you know the sag of the lens and you know where it lands you kind of know what the the sag of the eye is but um I, you know i think if you're fitting lenses and you're measuring that sagittal height of the ocular surface using an oct um, i think the most important thing to remember that and and at least maybe you can let us know how you how you feel about these terms i think the most important thing is if you're measuring the sag of the eye, make sure you know that that's not the sag you want for the lens, right? You want to add a factor of three, maybe 400 microns to that. Do you agree, Elise? Do you use this term much? Yes. Well, I, I mean, yes, for the lens, 
for the eye, you're right. It's we're not going to be using the sagittal height of the eye in in order to determine the lens. We're going to add to that, and that's important because the scleral lens is bolting over the cornea. So, yeah. Um, so, all in all, when we say sag you're typically referring to the lens. And so that's sort of how we made the acronym. And that's why we gave these the other ones, right? So the sagittal height, and, and here's just an example of the sagittal height of the actual cornea. You can appreciate um, how this is viewed on a pentacam here. Here's a kind of a shallow height. Here's a deeper height. Um, but again, back to the actual sagittal depth. So when we refer to sagittal depth or sag, we're referring to the lens itself. And so you can see these Com these may look a little bit complicated in terms of these diagrams, but really what they're here for is to just share what the relationship is typically with base curve and sag and diameter and sag, because so many of us have been accustomed to using base curve when we're designing any type of GP lens. Uh, and so the good thing is a steeper base curve, just like with a corneal lens, is going to give more depth to the lens. So it's going to give a higher sag value. However, most companies are going to give you the, the parameters in SAG. Now, you'll see there's a base curve on that. That's typically referring to that back optic zone radius base curve. Um, however, knowing the relationship, steeper base curve is probably going to give you a, a steeper SAG value. But again, I think once you get past the sort of change in in habit, the SAG is a lot easier to understand. And I came into scleral lenses at a good point because it was when they were already had some momentum. And so we were using SAG since I was a fourth year in, in school. So it wasn't such a transition, but I, I can appreciate how it's hard to say, wait, I thought we worked in base curve and now we're working in SAG. Um, in terms actually, of, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. If you go to the previous slide, you can actually see how much the diameter can influence the SAG here and even if with sim uh, equivalent k readings how much the hvid or the diameter of the cornea can actually influence and increase the sag so uh, definitely you know it's it's way more important to use sag than than base curve yeah i agree and you kind of let it right up to to the point i'm going to make here in a moment right which is even talking about diameter of the lens itself so the bigger you go in diameter, the deeper the effective sag is, if you will. So that goes for the cornea, like you can see in this example here. And the same thing goes for the lens itself. So where does that come in practically? Well, say you've got a patient in the chair and you fit them with a 15 and a half millimeter lens and the sag was 4,000 microns. Let's make it easy. That's probably a little deep, but we'll just make it easy for math. 15 and a half millimeters, 4,000 sag, right? So say you think, oh, I need to go to a bigger lens diameter. I want to go to an 18. Oh, well then instead of having to start from scratch in terms of fitting, you say, okay, I've gone a couple millimeters bigger, I'm going to need to add a couple. And unfortunately, I don't have an exact number for it, but I'll tell you, typically with every millimeter, I'll add about 200 microns. I don't know, Elise, do you ever, do you swap, do you go up in, in uh, diameters a lot? And do you have like a factor that you use to, if you change by one millimeter, do you know how much sag, more, more sag do you try to go for? Or do you just kind of Wing. I don't know. Like for some reason, I, I, I think in diopters. So I'm like, if I increase like by um, one diopter, then I'm increasing by 100 microns type of thing for most of my designs. So that's usually the way I think. But, you know, it comes with experience. And as you as you fit, you'll get more comfortable with that. You know, how many diopters or millimeters you have to change in order to get the type of, you know, clearance change or fluid reservoir change you're looking for. Yeah, I love it because Elise and I, without even talking about this before, we use, I use SAG, she uses base curve more. It's fine to use either. Just understanding the relationship between changing the base curve or changing the diameter and what that's going to do to SAG is important. And it, it's not even important that you memorize these relationships. Just work with the designs that you have. It'll become just like second nature trying to, you know, go from lens to lens and figure out how sag, base curve, diameter changes are going to eventually change change the lens fit. But ultimately, when we say sag, we're talking about the depth of that lens. Right. And, and so, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you go. <laughs>
All right, I'll go. So anyways, yeah, so talking about, and this is just the easy OAD overall diameter. And we actually, I noticed this today, we didn't, we don't actually have this really in the paper, but it's still something that you're going to see. Uh, and I think it's worth mentioning. And, you know, as I said, we're going to sprinkle in some, some talk about the actual fit as we're talking about this, because uh, it helps build some relevance to it, right? So again, I was talking about this, you know, patient, maybe they have this 15 and a half millimeter lens on this left eye here. That might be right. Maybe it's 14 and a half. And then you look at the the uh, right image there, and maybe that's more like a 16 and a half or even a 17 or 18 millimeter lens. Um, so that's, you know, your OAD is going to be the longest diameter. And the reason we specify the longest diameter is because more and more, you're seeing customizations of lenses and you might have a little notch or a change or a, um, you know, asymmetry in the lens so that there's different diameters depending on where you're measuring. And so, um, yeah, so you can, uh, you can, and you know that it's the longest diameter when you see the OAD value there. All right, and so they're broken down. This is uh, somewhat of what we, we've talked about. With the, the actual zones of a scleral lens are really broken down into three major zones. And you can see we have A, B, C here. Um, and you can see it kind of correlates to this A is the inner part of the lens, so the optic zone radius. We already talked about you have the back and the front. I'm not going to go too far into that stuff. You you do know the back optic zone is typically the one that determines the power, but not always. Um, but the optic zone radius in general is going to be the overall radius of curvature of the of the surface of the lens. And this is where the optics are. And this is where, of course, we're vaulting the central cornea. Vault is that other word that we use to, to you know, say how much uh, away from the cornea we actually are with the lens. And then we go into this mid peripheral zone. And this is one. So we we call it in the paper the transition zone or the transition zone radius. You can see we put an R on the end of these. And that's really indicating that these these areas have a radius of curvature. So I really like that adding an R onto the end of things just so you, you're reminded, okay, this area has a curvature. It's like a peripheral curve, how we say PC. Um, but these two are both of our peripheral curves. So we have the transition. I put limbal zone in there because you will hear people say that it's typically overlying the limbus. I don't get bent out of shape if people use a little different um, terms in that particular area but basically you know the transition zone is transitioning between the optic zone over the limbus and into that landing zone and again you'll hear people use haptic i put that here so that people who don't realize that that's a synonym can can appreciate that but the landing zone uh, again landing zone radius and this is typically going to be a set of a few different peripheral curves and this is to land evenly on the on the conjunctiva um, and then if you look at an OCT image, it's just a stitch together OCT image to sort of show you how the fitting relationship cross-sectionally should look, right? Your optic zone radius in yellow overlying the cornea, transitioning through that TZR into the landing zone radius. And so um, I think these acronyms are really helpful. Um, and, you know, at least showed that, that um, chart before. And what I, I you know, I was going to mention that you know the chart is is great and we have that if anyone wants that we can email that to you and you can make it your own a little bit right make it work exactly for your practice um, we encourage you of course to keep a lot of the common terminology but you may add things on that are acronyms that you use for your practice i work at one practice uh, on saturdays and they've got a laminated sheet of common acronyms it can be really helpful especially for people who are just um kind of getting into your practice technicians and things like that so that everybody's on the same page on what the parameters mean so that when you're ordering and when you're communicating with labs and communicating with other people in the office everybody uh kind of understands what what's going on the other terms just kind of going through some salt and pepper terms here the other one we always hear is prolate versus oblate a lot of lenses will have a prolate design and an oblate design. So A is our prolate, right? So a typical cornea, a normal cornea is actually a prolate surface. Um, keratoconus is 
excessively or ectasias are excessively prolate. Uh, and then you have an oblate here on the right. The B is the oblate lens or cornea. And that's where you've got that central flattening. So your transplant patients, your post LASIK patients, your post radial keratectomy patients. Um, those are the differences between the two designs and are the two cornea shapes. And Likewise, there's designs that are, are uh, accommodating to them. So that is terminology that's pretty universal. I can't think of a, another really uh, understandable common term for those. So hopefully there's not much confusion with, with those. And I'm going to pass it over to you, Dr. Kramer. Tell us a little bit about uh, more about how we actually want these lenses to fit. Right. So I think it's like one of the main reasons that we wanted to do this paper was to establish a common terminology uh, among practitioners and um, labs in order to streamline the, the fitting process. And the fitting process is important to understand as well. Uh, let's see. I don't see the slide. Oh, sorry about that. No worries. Um, <laughs> um, so there's three important parts that we need to understand when fitting a scleral lens. So first of all, the corneal clearance. So we don't want to be landing on the cornea, and we also don't want to be bolting too much. So I think that's key. Basically, what we're trying to do is not trouble the cornea or not interrupt the homeostasis by either creating too much mechanical friction or too much bolt, right? So there's this happy medium and we'll come to that. Limbal clearance, basically we don't wanna be causing any damage to the limbus by bearing it, like touching it, or by too much clearance, so about the same as the central cornea as well. And then scleral landing is where the lens is going to be finally coming into contact with the ocular surface. And we want it to land in a very gentle way. And again, we don't want to cause any interruptions of vasculature or, or cause any um, awareness of the lens because again, the lens is landing there. We want it to align with the ocular surface. So the lens vaults the cornea, which basically creates a, t uh, a tear fluid reservoir, which the acronym is FR between the lens and the eye, and it lies on the conjunctiva overlying the sclera. So when we're fitting a sclera lens, there's basically a series of steps that we go through, and they're all very important. But we're doing a diagnostic lens, so using a diagnostic lens. So scleral lenses are not fit empirically. They are not fit using you know, central case and refraction like many other lenses or specialty lenses are. What we have to do is acquire corneal topography or keratometry readings, and that's gonna give us an idea of the shape of the cornea Maria talked about prolate, oblate, this is important. Um, measuring the uh, horizontal visible iris diameter. Some topographers offer this information and there are rulers as well available uh, to measure this really easily, but very important, we talked about how much diameter can influence SAG. Um, so that's really important to measure. And as I mentioned, you can do this using a topographer or a ruler. Um, and you can use CD, which is corneal diameter. Um, and then uh, you can actually customize this if they have a different, you know, horizontal or vertical part. So some patients have a longer and more commonly have it longer horizontally than vertically. And some patients, it's the other way around. Then you want to determine, or again, the corneal profile, prolate versus oblate, and then consider also the palpebral fissure size. So obviously, if it's smaller, you might have a harder time putting a larger lens in there, where if it's, if it's larger, you definitely want to cover more surface. So that will help you determine the final lens parameters that you want to order. 
So when we talk about landing zone terminology, there's the primary functional sagittal depth of the lens and the primary functional diameter of the lens. So basically, these acronyms are important and, and these are used a lot in research actually and sometimes in clinic as well. So the primary functional sagittal depth or the, and, and also the primary functional uh, diameter of the lens is basically the part where it's going to the diameter until it lands right on the eye and not the entire diameter of the lens. So that's really important to understand. There's also the edge diameter, edge thickness, maximal edge thickness, venting channels, fenestrations, all of these different aspects are important um, when we talk about the landing zone terminology. So when we evaluate the fit of a scleral lens, what we're doing is taking the scleral lens, filling it with saline, and instilling fluorescein into the bowl before applying it to the eye. So what we're doing is, you can see here in this image, is, is a broad light, basically diffuse illumination with cobalt blue filter. And that's important to do initially in order to check whether we're bearing on, on the surface, just to give a general aspect and then evaluate with optic section using a white light. At, when we apply the lens, we estimate the lens thickness to tear thickness ratio. So what we wanna do is compare that tear film reservoir to the thickness of the lens. We never wanna compare that tear film reservoir to the thickness of the cornea because that can vary from patient to patient, from eye to eye, and even in the same eye, depending on where we are. So it's important to compare the tear from reservoir thickness to a known thickness, which is that of the lens. And, and a lot of your diagnostic lenses will come with a known thickness, so you will know that the thickness of the lens prior to using it, and you'll use it as a basis of comparison. It's important to wait 30 minutes after putting the lens on the eye. One comment uh, I'll add in there, Elise, because uh, I always get students, this is again, uh, maybe some of the younger practitioners, the CT and the ET, which we didn't include in here, but that center thickness and edge thickness. Um, I think that, you know, the edge thickness, if it's too thick and patients are uncomfortable, I pay attention, but that center thickness on all of your lens vials, it's going to have a CT value. So pay attention to that. That's how I always have students, well, how am I supposed to know the lens thickness? And right. uh, that's never. <laughs> in, in research, do you use the primary functional diameter a lot? Or you know, it, it's it's interesting uh, be, that you asked that because I'll turn my camera on here. So it's interesting. So I, not re I, I haven't up until this point, but we're doing a lot of we have a PhD student who's doing uh, really getting into the landing zone and the compression and the biomechanics and the IOP stuff. And so we are looking at it more and more. And, and part of what we're looking at is how consistent is that from patient to patient, right? Because I have always been, um, you know, kind of curious as to, but, but it makes sense, right? It's like, that's really what you want to think about. And and so, uh, you know, to add on to what Elise said, it's like, you can think of how wide, I always think about it as like, how wide is that landing zone, right? Because you can have an 18 millimeter lens that has this landing zone radius that's, you know, three mil, I mean, you probably won't, but you know, you could in theory have it, it's got a really long landing zone. So that lens is gonna land a lot kind of sooner outside the limbus than one that has maybe a shorter or a thinner, and you can play around with those parameters. So I think it's important. Um, I don't think we use it enough, probably. I think it's a little hard to conceptualize for some people. Um, but yeah, we're looking at that, um, you know, kind of going forward in, in some of the things. So I think it's interesting. Here's a yeah. slide too, to match what you, what you were talking about with this. Yeah. No, no, it's just, it's funny because in clinic, we really don't use the, yet at least the primary functional diameter, but it, it is interesting. And I think there's more to come with that. But uh, anyway, going back to this graphic. So step one uh, is the fluorescein, you know, putting it in the saline in the bowl of the lens and then uh, putting the lens on the eye. So you can see again, a cobalt blue filter diffuse illumination with a yellow rattan filter in this image on the left. But what we, what's really important here is the optic section. And as Maria said, you will know the, the thickness of your lens when it's put on the eye. Um, and then what you wanna do is use that optic section 
uh, and evaluate the the tear film reservoir in order to to check use it as a comparison. So let's see if we can get this video. Yeah, yeah. I'm basically showing. Yeah, so it'll it'll go through this cobalt blue where you know, like you were talking about, it's this kind of diffuse look, and then you can see she like brings it down to to the optic section. Mm -hmm. And what you want to do with that optic section is not just look in the center, but you want to bring it from the from nasal to temporal, just to make sure that you have that uh, fluid reservoir the whole way through um, on the cornea. And that's important because you you definitely don't want to be bearing on any part. So at least this yeah. this video I purposely put in. I changed it since you've seen it. It's a white light one because I thought it's kind of cool. This is a good example. So I'll let you talk through it, but it's white light. Yeah. So it's it's interesting because you actually really don't need fluorescine. You can see that the tear uh, the fluid reservoir without fluorescein as well. This is a great video. Um, obviously, for more you know beginners or novice fitters, you might feel more comfortable using fluorescein. But this is a great video showing that you can see that fluid reservoir without fluorescein as well. And you may actually not overestimate it or, or overestimate it less if you don't use fluorescein. So, um, yeah. So um, basically, you're when you use that optic section. You are using white light, so you're not using blue light anymore. And that little green line you see on the surface is really not so important for evaluating, uh, you know, scleral lens fitting, but it is, it is, you know, for other purposes. But what you want to look at, again, is your lens thickness, as Maria mentioned, CT, which is the center thickness. In this specific case, it's 0 0.35 millimeters, which is the same as 350 microns. Now, you can see, looking at that uh, fluid reservoir, that it's about the same. It's about a one-to-one -one ratio with the thickness of that lens. So, you're thinking, okay, it's about 350 microns, and that's about what you're looking for when you put the lens in um, at the beginning. So we do want to share and, and start sharing some of these for, for the next 20 minutes or so as we go through the some more, some more terms is some of the resources that we have available at the SLS website. And I'm happy to share these slides with anyone, but you don't even really need these this website because you just go to the scleral lens uh, website, sclerolens.org. And you have to be a member, but probably most of you are since you are here and you know about the webinar. Um, but if you go to our four practitioners site, we actually have a lot of clinical resources. So that image that Elise was just looking at is actually a downloadable, we have it in Spanish and English, uh, PDF. And it, it's this fit scale here. So this was made by Ferris State University. Um, and again, this is really helpful if you're first starting out and you're kind of looking at your lenses and maybe you look at your center thickness, but you just want something to, you know, be a comparison. You can look at this as uh, kind of a comparison to what you're seeing in your slit lamp and say, okay, yeah, that's 300 microns. I, I, I agree with it looking like this image here. The other thing that's nice about this scale, which again, you can download from the website, um, is and we also give them away at our booth actually too nice laminated ones but uh, if you look on the other side this will also show you some of the limbo vaulting and even edge relationships and we'll go through these uh, on their own but this is a, a nice resource that you can use that um, it's free and you just have to be a member so here if we look at I'm just going to kind of go through this these a little quickly. So the limbal flarence, right, this is in that TZR or transition zone radius. Like Elise mentioned, um, this is just looked at after you look at that apical zone. So um, the, the fluid reservoir is still going to be visible at the limbus. You typically want it to be kind of barely visible. I won't go into all the details. This isn't meant to be a, a, a fitting lecture per se, but um, just a reminder of that limbal clearance is measured in the lens area is what we call that, that TZR. 
And here's just some close-up examples. These were taken, I think, by Andrea Lasby. Oh, yeah, they're Andrea Lasby. And these are, I love these because this shows you this first one here. She's got a real tight optic section at that limbus. And you don't really see anything here. Optimal clearance, we typically say you want to see a little bit of clearance in that. So maybe this is 50 microns or so. Versus when you have some excessive clearance, that limits the oxygen in that area, can cause some other complications. Again, I won't go down uh, that row, but this is in that limbal area in that transition zone, radius zone of the lens. And I'll let uh, Dr. Kramer talk to you here about the evaluating the scleral landing zone. Yes, and, and probably one of the more complex parts of fitting a scleral lens, definitely. And you mentioned that your PhD student uh, or PhD candidate is doing this, and I'm really looking forward to learning more about the landing zone, but definitely a um, very important part of fitting scleral lenses. And you can evaluate it, and you want to evaluate it using white light diffuse illumination at the slit lamp. But if you have OCT technology, it's really, really useful as well to get an idea of how your edge is interacting with the conjunctiva. Um, so when you're looking at the scleral landing zone or if just the landing zone you can call it, you want to make sure that the lens is well aligned. So what we mean by that is, again, it's not lifting or causing an interruption in circulation or cutting off, you know, uh, the the the, the circulation of the vasculature in the conjunctiva. And both of those things are really important. So we'll see what those, those look like. So basically, these are examples of different scleral landings. So the first one is the ideal edge alignment, if you look at the top right there. So again, you're gently landing over the conjunctiva, not causing any um, cutting off of, of, of vasculature or interruption of circulation. If you look on the, on the left, you can see the edge lift. And that's really uncomfortable. Patients will complain. They will be back. That can lead to bubbles, debris, and different things accumulating under the lens. And it causes a lot of awareness. You can imagine that every time the patient will blink, they will feel that edge because it's just lifting off. Um, so that will usually happen if the edge is too flat compared to the shape of the surface that's landing on. On the other side, you can see what happens when it's a little too tight or landing too abruptly on, on the conjunctiva. You can see there's, you can have impingement and you can have severe impingement, um, which will cause rebound redness. And ultimately, if you leave that alone and you don't troubleshoot it, it can lead to atrophy. So you definitely want to fix that if you see it as well. So you can also have fine vessel blanching. So you can see that some of these larger vessels are not compressed, whereas you do see that it's a little bit too white there, and that's because the small vessels are being cut off, and that can also lead to uh, rebound redness and discomfort, especially after many hours of wear. Yeah, Elise, to add on, that's, you know, those that's one term that I always get Kind of stuck on certainly with the students is this blanching versus impingement term um, and I really do like to specify and, and maybe it's my sort of research minded but when I hear blanching you know again this fine vessel blanching I tell students blanching is sometimes you make changes sometimes you don't right this patient I'm probably not going to make many changes if they're not having any problems and I'm not getting rebound redness versus real impingement where you're really pinching in like we saw in the last slide um you know you, you really need to make changes so that, that is one term the blanching versus impingement that I kind of uh, like to stick to and and again, and you, and you can give your opinion too, but I, I, that's one of the terms where we don't have it in the paper. Um, it's more be consistent in your own practice. And if you have multiple doctors, how you're describing it, because so often, you know, you're going to have to look back in the charts and, and see 
you know, how lenses were fitting at previous exams. So I think that type of terminology I find, I mean, we've got, you know, 10 different doctors at UH fitting in different ways sometimes. And, you know, it, it's gotten a lot better, but, you know, I imagine it's the same out in private practice where if you're working with other people, if you're not describing these things the same way, it, it can be frustrating. What are you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and working with consultants as well as, well as la at laboratories. Um, I've also seen, you know, the difference between compression and impingement where one is closer to the edge and one is closer to the limbus, you know, so it's, it's, it is, can, can be confusing but i agree and i like that um you know blanching um is what you see in this image whereas impingement is really like that line where you see that there's a lot of interruption of circulation where there is a lot of uh, a compression uh and in the vasculature <laughs> cut off and that definitely needs to be troubleshooted whereas fine vessel blanching may be ignored in some cases and then we talk about LV, which is localized vaults. And there's a, a lot of proprietary terms for this, depending on the manufacturer that you're using. And, and it all means the same thing. What you're creating is this localized area of vault in, in a specified area of a certain amount. Um, and again, there's various ways of, of calling this based on the, the lab or the design that you're using. But the terminology for this is LV, which is localized vaults. And these are very useful for avoiding or vaulting over conjunctival obstacles, which comes in really handy, at least here in South Florida, where everyone has a pinguicula. Um, but, you know, blebs, sometimes small blebs or cysts. And I'm sure in Houston you have. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll I'll even just add to that, you know, this is another one that I like, right? Because vault is a term that we use a lot in scleral lenses. How much is it vaulting? How much is it vaulting? Students, I see their heads spinning, right? So when you have localized vault, that, you know, it may, gives it some uniqueness so people know what you're actually talking about. Otherwise, they're going to think they're talking about the clearance or something, right? Correct. Correct. Absolutely. All right. And again, I just want to bring us back and look again at some of the the clinical resources that we have here. So what we all what we just talked about, we actually have some uh, examination forms. So if you don't know this, and especially if you're starting in practice, um, trying to figure out how to fix your forms. And actually, since this version, we actually updated a little bit. And I have to give a shout out to Pam Satchwa Sharfong. She was our president two years ago. Uh, and this was kind of her baby, but it's been two years. So we're, we're updating it right now. So the new version should be online soon. Um, but this is an examination form that you guys can use in your practices when you're learning or even just to help guide you in terms of what how you want to design your uh, medical record. And it has a front and a back and has different specialized areas where you can add in some of these these terms. And again, these are available on our website. So we encourage you to, to take advantage of these. The other thing that I think is a lot cooler, honestly, um, because this is something and we're, we're actually working to get these as like tearaway sheets that you can, they'll be in color and we're going to give them away at conferences and probably mail them to some of you guys. And so they're going to be like these tearaway sheets that you can just rip off and fill out. These are actually front and back. So it's just both on here. These are for, this is a collaboration we did with the dry eye shop and these are for patients. Um, so this is part of helping them to understand the different terminology that we use and also learning how to use their lenses. So um, we know this, but you can imagine just looking at this, the sea of words that patients are not going to know, like how many words on this sheet? That's a that's a game you can play with your patients. How many words on this sheet do we use in the the day to day layman's English language? Not many. So it's helpful, especially with these all the different names for the different solutions. Um, it's helpful to give patients written information. So I really encourage you guys, these are downloadable, um, but you can check the boxes and kind of let them know what their what your recommendations for them are. Um, and then we have the different, different types of solutions that they can use, right? Cleaning, disinfection, solution, uh, storage solutions, right? It gets really complicated for patients. So these are things that, that can help you describe the different terminology to patients and just help them learn and, and understand, um, you know, the, the modality that they're in. The other thing that we have, again, available in that clinical resources page on our four practitioners on the website 
is patient information on lens application and removal. And Elise will talk about this in, in just a minute, probably kind of breeze through it because most of us know. But, you know, we, we really argued about application or insertion because people use a different term. We go with application. We're applying the lens to the eye. Again, it sounds, I think, more professional. And if we're all using the same word, it's a lot more, uh, it, it's a lot easier for patients to, to understand it. And then lens removal and, uh, of course, instructions for each. Um, and lastly, just for resources, we've got online books and guides and things. Uh, you can, some of these are, are PDFs for free, like these two here that you can download. Uh, some of them, they want a little token from you, but uh, you can decide if that's if that's something you want to do. But there are free ones. Here's the, you can click it here uh, if you want the free one. Back to you, Elise. Yep. So then, you know, after you've got your fit under control, you definitely want to do an over refraction. Most of these patients uh, are coming in because they want to see better. Um, so over refraction is really key. Um, recommend doing retinoscopy or auto refraction. That gives you a good starting point. Obviously, you're neutralizing a lot of the corneal cylinder. So your retinoscopy should be, if, even if you have an irregular cornea, it should be pretty easily done, auto refraction as well. And then you can see what the visual acuity is with the sphere alone. And then after that, you can do a spherocylindrical over refraction to see if you get any improvement. So we, we definitely sometimes recommend ordering the scleral optics first and then doing a sphere a, a spheral cylindrical over refraction at follow up um, because there might that uh, cylinder coming out may be from induced cylinder and not residual cylinder so that's important to differentiate so you want to be careful that your lens is not too decentered that it's not rotated and that there's no flexure so when you order your lens um, it's really important to use consultants, become familiar with the manufacturers that you're using. Um, consultants are extremely helpful and that's what they're there for. So these are not customer service representatives. These are people who understand the lens design that can walk you through things. So just use them, ask questions, and you will learn for sure. This is a contact lens. So the basic you know, GP rules do apply. So SAM and FAP, you have to vertex, you know, plus or minus four, and um, you, you can customize your materials. So you may want to consider a higher DK in certain situations. Some patients may request a tint um, on their lens, and you can certainly add lens treatments like Hydropeg and others if needed. So you might want to verify your diagnostic lenses. Actually, this happened to me a, a couple weeks ago where all my lenses were mixed up. You know, in clinic, sometimes there's a lot going on and you're cleaning the lenses, you're disinfecting them, then you're putting them back and it's just things can get mixed up. So in order to reduce your chair time and, and increase your rate of success, I do highly encourage you to periodically check your lenses um, with a radioscope or a lensometer or even sometimes the lenses have codes on them that you can you can actually put them in the right place so you know what you're doing yeah to to add to your comment about the codes so some of the manufacturers um, and we encourage all of them to do this um, is they will laser mark the diagnostic some sort of identifier on the lens itself and i'll tell you if you fit a lot of lenses and you have a good relationship with your lab um if you ask them to do this for your diagnostic set they just might do it so the more of us that ask maybe the more of them will do it i think um it's they, most of them have lasers they can etch things onto the lens we even have some who i love who will etch the the patient's information like the patient's serial number that's the best on the lens because we know not only do our diagnostic lenses get mixed up but patients will mix up their lenses so it's nice to be able to to have those little markings on there absolutely um so there's a great video as well as on one of our resources online. Uh, this is great for practitioners and also for patients. Uh, it just shows the basics about application removal. Um, there's also talking about 
uh, it's important when you are dispensing your lenses that you talk about the solutions. I personally like to sell them in my office so that my patients walk away with what I'm recommending. You don't have to do that, but it's important that they know. So if you want to download that sheet that Maria showed with the various solutions and just check them off or circle them so they know what to look for. I think the images are really helpful so they can identify them online if they are buying them online or, or you know, in, in retail shops. Um, handout, so we have, again, resources online, but you can create your own handouts, but it's important to give patients information. A lot of the time they're overwhelmed, so the more information, the better. You can never have too much. So when you're applying, there's various ways of doing this. You can use the, the three-finger tripod method, two fingers, the rings, uh, the little devices. The plunger is really popular, uh, uh, especially I think most of my patients are using plungers, but some of them have a really, really hard time. And so the sea green has a light there that's really useful for a lot of patients, and, and a lot of my patients are using this as well. Yeah, and uh, you know, given that this is you know a terminology lecture, a, a fun fact, you know, I always I I do a little quiz for some of the students. It doesn't count for anything, but just to to see what they know um, for fun. And I always ask, what is the name of this device? And nobody ever gets that it. it's the C Green Lens Inserter. Um, but again, you know, I I think these types of things, terminology is it, people. Think that you know more when you know what you're talking about. If patients come in and say, I got the C green lens inserter, and you say, What's that? But you know what this device is, you're gonna, you know, not look like you're you're on the up and up. So again, terminology has its applications throughout when you're communicating with practitioners, industry, and of course when you're when you're talking to patients. So this all falls under uh, you know, knowing the terms of of the profession. Yeah, and so uh I Again, when we talk about removal, so uh, there's there's some videos we have, again, in the videos you can see, but in this case, the smaller plunger is used. And I think the most important thing about removal is that you put the plunger toward the bottom half of, or the inferior part of the lens, and that will cause less pressure when removing it. And another thing is, a lot of the times the, the lens will be kind of stuck, maybe stuck to the eye at the end of the day, whether it's from dryness or just the patient's been wearing it for several hours. And so you do want to create maybe an air bubble or some movement in the lens prior to trying to remove it. And this really, really helps and is key for a lot of patients. So I'm just going to kind of breeze through these. We've just got another minute here, but this is just, again, to show some of the images of some of the application solutions so you can help communicate these names uh, with patients so that they understand what the different options and kind of what's a brand name, what's a generic name. Uh, it can take some time to wrap your head around that. Uh, lens care systems, a couple tips on here, but um, again, there's a lot of different types of systems showing patients pictures so that they have a photo to go with the name. Uh, we certainly know people, you know, I have that little red cap and the fizzy things, right? We know what that means, but the more we use the language of the profession, uh, the more I think it helps everybody to be on the same page and understand exactly what everybody's uh, situation is. And I'll hand it back over to you to finish up, Carolee. Yeah, so follow up, and actually I'm gonna take this opportunity to answer one of the questions, is how to evolve, evaluate follow-up visits where a patient comes in wearing a lens and without fluorescein. So um, patient is gonna come back wearing their lens. You're not putting fluorescein in. So you may wanna use OCT if you have that technology, but we did show that video of how you can evaluate the, the, uh, the, the fluid reservoir without fluorescein. And I think both of those things can be done. But in, in general, follow-up is going to be depending on the patient how many modifications you have to make usually if you're making changes you want to see them every two weeks after you finalize you might want to see them again in a month just to confirm and certainly in the warranty period so various manufacturers have different warranty periods if they're nowhere you might want to see them six months after just to make sure everything's okay and certainly reevaluate them every year 
And then what we do at follow up is take a history, make sure they're comfortable, how their vision is, how long are they wearing the lens, what solutions they're using. You'd be really surprised by what patients do with their solutions, but it's important to confirm and just confirm compliance and, and all of that. And then you do want to remove the lens, make sure that the ocular surface is healthy um, and that they're it's not causing any damage to the limbus, the cornea, the conjunctiva, and then schedule the next follow-up. So basically, scleral lenses come in a wide range of sizes and designs. Terminology is important. It's important for us to be able to communicate amongst ourselves, colleagues, with patients, us to streamline the consultation process. It would just make it so much easier if we all use the same terminology. The paper is available on uh, contact lens and interior. I recommend to read it. Um, although we don't use all of the terminology, I think for the, the terms that we do use, it's important to streamline that. Um, and definitely when you're fitting thorough lenses, use your consultants, use the terminology, get them used to it, get your staff on board, get your patients on board. Um, and I think that one of the best ways to be successful with scleral lenses is proper technique and educating your patients to use everything the right way. I agree, Elise, and uh, I yeah, I totally agree. And you know, I can't see the questions for some reason, so we we are out of time here. But I'm happy to stay on for a couple minutes if there's any questions to to add. Um, but for those of you who do have to go, uh, thank you for attending. There is going to be a webinar or a survey that comes up at the very end of this webinar. Please, please stay on and fill it out. It really helps us to know what you guys uh, think and how we can make these webinars better for you. And I'll also tell you, we have our next webinar. It's his first webinar with the SLS, but I personally have listened to him talk and I think he's fantastic and energetic. Um, and I'm so delighted. We've been waiting until we could get uh, Dr. Josh Davidson in on the slot. We asked him a couple of times and he was busy. Um, he's gonna talk about making specialty lens practice a well-oiled machine. I will definitely be there and I hope to see y'all there. And then Elise, I don't know, is there any other questions or are we good here? There's a few coming in. Uh, regarding limbal clearances, the stem cells receive their oxygen from the surrounding conjunctival vasculature. How does excessive limbal clearance affect this area if this is correct thinking? And this is from Jim Williamson. Uh, I can answer that probably pretty quickly. Um, you know, we don't really know. <laughs> so, you know, all evidence would seem to lend us a thing that if you put a scleral lens on the eye, you're going to cause problems with hypoxia on the limbus. And yet, we have patients with limbal stem cell deficiency who do better and heal. And so, you know, there's this, there's a mechanical component, I think, right? So with the limbal stem cells, a lot of it's thought to be like the protection of the lens is better than the hypoxic situation. Um, you know, I think the the you know limbal I, I i don't think you have to really worry that much about the limbus i think keep the landing zone relative or the limbus relatively uh low and you'll get enough oxygen and i hope i answered that question okay i'm trying to kind of read yeah. Elise, do you have anything to add uh no i just think that you know causing too much clearance can cause microcystic edema as well because you are lowering the oxygen so I think it's important not to to bear or to cause too much clearance uh, or, or volt because you can um, limit the amount of oxygen. So that's the only thing I would add. Another question is, what do you do? What is the issue if you notice a ring on the conjunctiva after a patient removes a scleral lens? And usually that's because it's, it's just landing too abruptly and, and a little bit too steep on the edge and um, it needs to be flattened on the edge. I don't know if, if you feel the same way about that, Maria. Um, I, uh, yes and no, <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll argue a little. So I would say uh, it, it, with most patients, I find I get some sort of compression ring and I call it an impression ring because I think it sounds better and it's a little bit less scary than a compression ring, right? So I, I tell patients, you know, you wear a watch, you get a little impression, you wear a pair of rib socks, you get a little compression. So it's okay to get a little bit of, you know, com you know, impression of that tissue. 
What I tell them to look for is two things. One, does it go away after a couple of minutes? And two, does the eye get red? If it doesn't get red and you just kind of have a little bit of an imprint and it goes away after five minutes, I, I don't really have a problem with that. I think there's, you know, different people have different comfort levels, but certainly the, the what I look for is re, that rebound redness after removal. Yeah, and I think there you can't really go too flat on the edge because then you cause lens awareness. So it's, it's, there's really a happy medium. And I think we can take one more question here is, I've heard a common complaint from patients who tried and dropped out of sclerals that they grew tired of clouding and mucus. Ooh, this is good for you, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> the need to refresh. Is that something patients need to live with? Or is it purely an issue? I don't think there could be a better person to answer this question. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I, I don't know. So it, we've gotten a lot better at managing that mucus. I think the first step is identify what it actually is. Is it the lens itself that's getting debris? Is it? So if it's a lens cleaning issue, I always go for Progent. Um, I do, I use Progent and I have patients who use it weekly. Um, I won't go too far down this train because I want to talk a little bit about the other things for a moment, but um, if you don't know what it is, look it up, email me, we'll talk about it, but use Progen, that's very helpful. You know, the clouding, I think the, the first thing with the clouding is, is it like real midday fogging, right, where you get this fog in the tear reservoir? Um, you know, quickly, I think, lower the fluid reservoir as much as you can, so like 100 microns over the apex, that's fine. Make sure you don't settle in, that's after settling, um, so you'll remove that a little bit. Um, you know, I use anything from a morning tear wash to allergy medications to salivisk in the fluid reservoir. Those are the three big ones. Sometimes they work for patients, sometimes they don't. So you got to kind of troubleshoot with the patient, look at their eyelids. Do they have meibomian gland dysfunction? Treat that. Um, you know, typically we think it's some lipids in there with midday fogging, maybe some neutrophils, probably some neutrophils. So Anything that removes inflammation on the ocular surface is going to be be good and using viscous solution. So I would say, no, you're not. You're not just not able to wear lenses. I think we've done, come so far with what we can do for patients with debris. So I'll, I'll keep it as that long slash short answer. And if anybody has further questions, you always can email me. I'm fine with that. Thank you. Well, thanks for this opportunity. And I hope you guys learned uh, a lot. And you can definitely email us if you have questions. And don't forget to stay when we shut off for the webinar or for the survey at the end. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful night. Thank you.